go ahead and worship God tonight. Just go ahead and give him glory. Give him praise tonight. It's worthy to be glorified. It's worthy to be honored. Father, we thank you. We magnify your holy name. Be thou exalted. Be glorified. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have worshiped. Authority in heaven, as we study your word together tonight, we ask that you speak to us by yourself in Jesus' name. Father, in a way, we have never been taught by you before. Father, teach us tonight in Jesus' name. Let your word be opened unto us in the name of Jesus Christ. That at the end of this meeting tonight, we will be better Christians than we came in tonight. In the name of Jesus and we'll be careful to return all the glory to you. Thank you, faithful God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. You're welcome. Please let me welcome your neighbor to church this evening. You're all welcome in Jesus' name. How has been our day? Huh? Fine, fine. Amen. Hallelujah. We appreciate God for another opportunity to come and learn at his feet tonight. We will continue our teaching on faith, raising children in faith. And today we'll be looking at the topic, the faith of Mordecai, raising children in faith. The faith of Mordecai, Raising children in faith. Last week we looked at Eunice raising her son, Timothy, God's way. And what Timothy became, credits to, the, to his up, I mean, to the upbringing that Eunice gave to Timothy. We're able to read the book of 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy, Apostle Paul, you know, said a lot about how committed Timothy was to the cause of the gospel. It is because he was, I mean, he was raised the way of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Raising our children the way of the Lord is something we must be intentional about as we have always been discussing. It's not something that we leave to chance. It's not something that we leave to the society. No, gone are those days when, you know, you expect the society to help you train your child. Those days, in, even in the society, there were values. You know, there were good training. There were home training in the society, those days, that, you know, when children, when they commit errors, you, you, you expect that if there's an elderly person around, we correct the child. Sometimes they will scold the child. Sometimes they may even flog your child, and you will appreciate the person. That was when, in the society, there were still values. But these days, the society has so much decayed that you can't even trust the society. We can't trust the school we put our children into. You can't trust the, sh the, sh I mean, the friends they mingle with. You can't even trust the next door neighbor to help nurture or take care of your child. So that is why it is important that the, uh, raising our children in God's way, in faith, is something we must be intentional about. You know, something we must do as a matter of urgency. Something we must be committed to. You know, these days, well, we know we have career men, career ladies, and all that. So, quite a number of us, we are busy chasing money, chasing fame, chasing a career, and all that at the expense of the children. So it is important tonight that we go back to the drawing board. 
Because it's something we must be intentional about. There's an adage that says, a child that is not trained will be the one that will sell the house that was built. The career you are chasing, the wealth you are gathering, if your child is not well trained, one day you will leave. And I, I tell you, in a matter of months, whatever you think you have gathered can disappear. They can waste it. That is why it is important we look into it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, those days they said uh, it takes two persons to give birth to children and it takes many hands to train it. So, the many hands are no longer available. That is the truth of the matter. Because nobody wants to train your child for you. As a matter of fact, the kind of environment and the community we are, if, you're, if a teacher flogs your child the way you think it should not do, the teacher, the, the teacher may be arrested. Amen? Amen? If you feel, ah, this discipline, no, this is not how I discipline my child. The teacher has gone too far. You know, you may take it up. So, even the teachers, they are very, very careful. I know there are some schools that, sir, yes, yes, yes. So there's government policy that forbid them from flogging children. Yes. So the government policy, you know, Restrain them. They cannot go too far. Even there are some schools that they don't even scold. The principal, then, eh, don't pour sans to my Gary. Don't spoil show for me. So the teacher cannot even, you can't shout. You can't, you know, praise the Lord. So the, the, the society we, we, ha, we are has gone that bad. And I pray that God will help us to train our children the way of the Lord in Jesus' name. Today we'll be looking at Mordecai raising his adopted daughter. It is not a woman's job to raise her daughter alone anymore than it is a man's responsibility to raise his son alone. Both parties are necessary and required and should have what to contribute to all children. Praise the Lord. You must not say, oh, this is a girl's child. It has to be the mother that will nurture or that will train. We can see Mordecai that we are discussing today, an uncle to a girl child. And the way he nurtured, he trained Esther. So it's no longer, no, women are fierce. It's no longer that, oh, daddy just provide the money, provide everything we need in the house, provide and look away. Whatever happens afterward, the woman takes care. No. It is the responsibility of both the man and the woman, the father and the mother, to nurture both the male child and the female child in the way of the Lord. There's even this law of attraction, I think in sociology or psychology, that says that uh, uh, a girl child tends to be closer to the father while a boy tends to be closer to the mother. Praise the Lord. Well I, I, well, I don't have experience about the girl side anyway. For those of us that have girls, I don't know how true it is. But for the guys that I, that I'm experience, I have experience, I know they're always around their mother. Anything they want to get, they want to use it, they will go and discuss with her. You know? And that is how it is. So, as fathers, we must not shy away from raising 
our children, particularly the girl's child. Don't leave everything to the mother. No. We have the responsibilities. Both of us, we have the responsibility. We need to gather information on how we can come in. Get information on what you need to know about raising a girl child. Information about their growth, information about their needs. Get them as a father. Get them. So that when they are discussing, you will not just look lost. You will not just, mm, shut up. Because you know, you'll be able to come in. You'll be able to you know, assist. And I pray God will help us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The same goes to our mothers too. So Mordecai was a man who took his responsibility towards his family seriously. It is good to pursue career. It is good. It's good to pursue fame. It's excellent to make money. But it is more important to train our children in the way of the Lord. So that at the end of the day, we may have rest. There are parents today that are regretting certain things that they didn't do when they were supposed to do it. There are certain parents that cannot sleep with their two eyes closed. If their children are not around them, they cannot rest. They don't know what the child may have done wherever they are. And there are parents that can boldly say, why? Because God has helped them to nurture their children in the way of the Lord. If they say, oh, there's something happening, then no daughter, there's a riot. Some parents will tell you that, no, I know my son cannot be there. I know my daughter cannot be there. Why? Because they've been able to raise that child in the way of the Lord. There are some values that they have been imputed into that child that they know that if these things are happening, the child will not be there. And it's very, very important that we train our children that way. And I pray God will help us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. When Esther's parent died, he immediately stepped in as her uncle, and adopted her into his home. Esther chapter 2, verse 7. Esther chapter 2, verse 7. It is instructive to note that there is no mention of if he had a wife and children in the Bible. That was Mordecai. It was not recorded. Maybe he took Mordecai, I mean, he took Esther to the wife, that the wife helped nurture Esther along with the other children. It was not recorded. So all we have, all the information we have is that he took Esther and trained Esther. So it is important to know that he must have done it himself. He did it himself. Gave instruction. Followed up. Supervised. And part of the nurturing, part of you know, the training is that we supervise and make sure whatever assignment or whatever things we ask them to do, that it is done. I know most parents today, you just give out the instruction, you don't even come back to check. Praise the Lord. How many of us ask our children after service on Sunday, they got home, what did you learn in church today? Every day we are careful to look at their, you know, their books when they are back from school, check their assignment, how are they doing, how are they feeling. When they return from church, how many of us take time to ask them, what did you learn in your, in your class today? What was the topic? What did you gain from it? And it's a function of the importance we you know. We pay 
to nurturing them in the way of the Lord. They can be bright academically. It's good. Gather men in degrees. It's fine. But if they don't have Christ, whatever they've gathered, it's a waste. Or whatever we have expended on them to gather those things, it's waste. And I pray today, your investment in your children will not be a waste in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And that is why, while you are looking after their education, while you are looking after their personal well-being, physical well-being, their spiritual well-being is as important as all others. Make sure they know your God. Make sure they serve your God. Encourage them. And one important thing about children, research has shown that they learn more by what they see. Small children, visuals. That's why you see oh, they're, they're, you know, captivating pictures. You know, by visuals, they learn. They learn very fast. Even when they grow, they tend to learn faster from what they see you do. You cannot be telling them, go and study your Bible, go and read your Bible, when they know that you don't read it. They will not. You can't tell them, go and pray. When they see you are not praying, you can't tell them to go and pray and they do it. No. So we must be the model we must model the life that we want to see in them. We, mo we must model that life. They must see it in us. They learn faster when they see us do those things than when we just dish out instructions to them and ask them to go and do it. So it's a lesson for us. Whatever thing that you want them to do, whatever thing that you want them, you no, know, let them see you do it. That way, they can easily pick it up and do. And I pray that God will help us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Mordecai did such a good job bracing and instructing Esther that she gained favor from the person in charge of the king's harem. In Esther chapter 2 and verse 9. Esther chapter 2 verse 9. You know, even in our society today, it doesn't matter the level of decadence. But if you still see children that, ha that are from good homes, that are well taught, that are taught the way of the law, you can easily identify them. Among their equals, they are distinct. Their way of life, you can see it. It will show. The training Mordecai gave Esther distinguished her among every other virgin that were there. There was something about Esther that caught the attention, that got her that favor. So out of divine wisdom, Mordecai gave Esther the instruction not to tell anyone about her background. As they say, teach your children that it is not everything they must talk about. Some children or youth of today talk too much. Esther chapter 2 verse 10. She was instructed, don't disclose your background to anybody. Don't let them know you are a Jew. Just keep silent. It is not everything that you talk about. It shows the level of discipline. It shows the level of obedience to instruction. 
It is equally possible. When Esther got to the palace, she saw everybody, saw this thing. No. She may have decided to join them, behave like every other virgin there. But because she was well brought up, because of the instructions that Mordecai gave to her, she didn't join the others. She lived according to the way of the Lord. And she was distinguished. So we need to teach our children. You know, it's not everything that you talk about. It's not everything. You know, these days, days of uh, social media, it is not everything that you put on social media. It is not everything about your life, about your family, that you throw out there. There are certain things that are meant to be kept. I once read that kidnappers, they, walk, they, look, they go to social media space and search for, you know, information about people. Maybe people throwing party, people that know, display this, display that, display this, and they begin to track them, and they will be targets to the kidnappers. Information about the family. How well can your children keep them? Esther was able to keep those things Mordecai asked her to keep. Don't divulge this information. Keep it to yourself. And she kept it. That's the function of good upbringing. Even though Esther was in the king's palace, Mordecai checked on her welfare every day. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Every day. For that period. Every day. Mordecai comes around every day to look after Esther's well-being. How often do you look after your children's well-being? How often do you do that? Some of us, we go, we wake up very early in the morning, we leave the house like 4.35, we return late night, 9 p.m., 10. The children, they are asleep before we come back and before they wake up in the morning, we are off. Some of us, the only time our children see us during weekends, even the weekends, you know, Saturdays, there are a lot of engagements, a lot of Owambe, oh, you will go there, you, this and that. On Sunday, you are in church. After service, maybe there's one meeting or the other. Before you get home, you are tired. When you get home, you want to relax because you are, you are rushing out on Monday morning, no time for them. We need to create this time. We need to be intentional about it. Mordecai checked on Esther every day. And because he checked on her every day, if she notices anything, it is easy for him to correct it on time before, you know, it goes out of hand. So a child you check every week or every month, you cannot be compared with the one that you check every day. Because if you are checking every day, whatever you discover, oh, no, this one is not, you correct it and you move on. So, the well-being of our children, both physical and spiritual, very, very important. Every day, we must make sure 
every day we check them. Though it's very tasty. But the truth of the matter is, if we fail to do it, I pray we will not regret it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Because that's why we must create the time. We must create the time. No matter how tight our schedules are, we must create time for them to be able to teach them the way of the Lord. You must be there for them. You must see you there. It's not when they need a father figure. You are not there. Forget about all these things that you buy for them. They, they know what relationship means. They value it. Children value relationship. You relate with them, interact with them. They get close to you. They are able to discuss their challenges with you. Another very, very important thing is we must learn to hear them out. Don't shut them down. Very, very important. Always give listening ears to them. One day, you know, we're preparing our little boy for school. And he started crying. Ah, what happened? I don't want to go to that school today. Ah, what happened? What happened? I don't want to go. I don't want to go. After much press, he opened up. He said, Mrs. Olu used to hit me uh, with ruler on my head. Ah, why now? What did you do? Eh, because he would say, I didn't write very well and all that and all that. Okay, sorry. We're going to tell her not to hit you on the head again. Is that fine? He said, yes. And he went to school. And we're able to address that. We took it up with the head teacher. This is what, this is what, this is what. Please, we don't want it to happen. And that was it. We heard story of a particular child that, you know, the mother was taking her to school. And the, 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 the wore the school shoe for the girl. There was scorpion in the shoe. And the girl was crying. I want to remove this shoe. I want to remove this shoe. What's wrong with you? Why do you want to remove your school shoe? Come on, move. Come on, move. Drag the child. Drag the child until the child got to school. Drop the child in school and went to work. It was at school that they discovered that it was actually a scorpion that was in the shoes. And that was why the girl wanted to remove the shoe. But because the mother would not listen, because you would, you would not want to hear them out, no matter how little they are, give listening ear. One of our lecturers says that no matter how stupid a question is, ask. That even if you don't learn anything from that question, you will learn stupidity. So no matter how stupid we think the question they are asking, listen to them. Give a listening ear and attend to their question. I pray God will help us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So despite other responsibilities, Mordecai took time to check on Esther every day. Do we pay daily attention to our children? Or do we push them to one side for days? or weeks, or even months, to nurture them the way of the Lord, availability is very, very important. We owe them the duty of care. We owe them 
the duty of care. And I pray that God will help us to really care about them in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I see God will help us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Esther was so well brought up that she refused to choose of the wealth available to her. Rather, asking the man in charge to select for her. She was not overtaken by material things. Esther chapter 2, verse 15. Esther chapter 2, verse 15. The way she was brought up. She was brought up in a way that she was not enticed by the wealth. She was not distracted by what others are flaunting around. There's this thing they call contentment. She was trained with contentment that whatever you have, be satisfied. Why believe in God for something better? I hope we know that there's a difference between contentment and settling for less. She learned contentment. When she was asked to choose, choose. She could as well have chosen all the jewelries, everything, everything. But she asked the officer, just choose for me. Whatever you give to me, I'm fine. Contentment. And honestly, you know, I believe that was what, part of what uh, made her to be selected. You know, the officer has been with the king for a while. The officer is quite aware of the king's specs. The kind of apparel the king loves. The kind of perfume the king will love. You know, if she had maybe chosen by herself, she may have chosen the wrong one or the one that the king detests. But leaving the man in charge to choose is wisdom. Because the man knows. Because the man has been there. Possibly, she may be the one that has been choosing the one that Queen Vashti was using. So, let us teach them contentment. Very, very important. It's not everything that you see that somebody has that you want to have. No, it's good to pamper our children. Fine. It's good. But let them know that it's not everything that they want that they can have. It's not everything they see that somebody else has. They ask you and you provide for them. You are not teaching them contentment. It's good to go, go out of your way to make sure your children are happy. No, it's good. But make sure you are not spoiling them. It is important. Whatever you have, if you cannot afford a bowl of ice cream, give them what you have and let them be contented with it. Sir, you want to say something, sir? Yes, sir. 200 naira. Buy for them and let them know that this is what we can afford for now. That where we can afford that, I will get it for you. So it is very, very important. It's not that, oh, because he said uh, he wants, uh, um, uh, what's it called? What's this? Um, sir? Coast stone. And you are running from pillar to post. You want to go and look for coast stone and bring. It is important we teach them contentment. Okay, this is what is available. Let's bless God for the one that is available. Why we are trusting him to provide something better for us. And I pray God will help us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I say God will help us in Jesus' name. 
we are so cold this evening. You see that? Amen. Okay, I just want to believe it's, it is entering us. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's sinking. Amen. So Esther was obedient to her uncle, turned father, even after she was selected to be queen. Many years forget their parents once they achieve small success. Esther, 20, Esther chapter 2, verse 20. To a large extent, this is determined by the level of closeness or relationship or bond maintained with our children from a tender age. Even when she became the queen, she, st she still listens to Mordecai. A child that is brought up in the way of the Lord, a child that is well trained, it doesn't matter what the child becomes in future. The child will not abandon the parent. The child will still listen. But nowadays, you know, children of nowadays, just small, just hit small money and you forget about your parent. So, it's a function of our level of relationship. The bond we have with them, why training them? If you are not close to them, it, it will be easy for them to forget you when they leave your vicinity. So, it is the level of bonds that we have with them that will tell after they leave our surroundings. Some children, they will, go, they will go to school the entire semester. Some will not even call home. I don't know, I don't know if, if we have heard it before. Some, a full session, they, will, they may not even call. Even if you call, the, the parent call them, Dad, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I said, when they need money, <laughs> praise the Lord. Some may not even call, even when they need money. Praise the Lord. But there are some that we always want to check back. Oh, Dad, how are you? I hope you are fine. Hi, Mom. I just want to check on you. There are some that, that, that do that regularly. So, it's a, it's, I mean, it's a function of the relationship that has been built over time. When they were young, when they were growing, were you always around? If at the tender age they have lived, they have been able to live their life without your presence, without you being around. So what do you expect when they grow old? So as parents, we must be intentional. We must make sure that the life they, they live, we must make it very, very difficult for them to just, I'm not around and they are not perturbed. Praise the Lord. For some parents, if you are going out, your children will be asking, Daddy, when are you coming back? I hope you will soon come back. And for some, when they are going out, <laughs> it's bye-bye. Hallelujah. Amen. So they are happy. Ah, the lion of the tribe of our family has gone out. So we can have some free time to ourselves. Amen. So, but what are we saying? Why not showing our children? We must have relationship, close relationship with them. A relationship that even if they go anywhere, they will easily remember. When Esther got to the palace, she didn't forget Mordecai. It's a, it's a function of the relationship. Esther had such a good relationship with her adopted father that as soon as she heard that, he was in sorrow over Haman's plan. She immediately reached out to him. Esther chapter 4, 4 to 6. When she had the plans that Haman had, the plan to kill all the, the entire Jews, that Mordecai was sorrowful, he had, she had that Mordecai was sorrowful, she immediately reached out. What is the matter? She 
She didn't feel that, yes, I'm in the palace. Whatever happened out there is none of my business. No. That whatever happens to Mordecai, no. Because of that relationship, she reached out and began to sort for a solution. Mordecai had more faith in God than he had in Esther's position and status. He believed that if Esther was unwilling or unable to save them, God will bring deliverance from another source. Let's see Esther chapter 4, 13 to 14. Esther chapter 4, 13 to 14. He sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. From his statement, you will know that he believes so much in God. That peradventure, you are not bored. Peradventure, you are not ready to do anything. Or peradventure, you are not able to do anything. I know that help will come. So he believed. And I know that that statement must have challenged Esther. So, help will always come. You know, sometimes um, we parents, we must make sure, or we must always make sure that our children know that the source of whatever we are giving them is God. One thing I do often is when they come to ask me for something, I'll tell, go and ask God. Tell God to provide for us so that we can give this thing to you. So we must always point them to God. It's not that, oh, uh, she needs this thing today, you give it. She needs another thing. If you are doing that, they will, see, they will be seeing you as what? As what? The provider. They will be seeing you as the provider. Always point them to God. Some, you even tell them, you need this one oh, to get this. You know, you need to fast and pray. So that God can do it fast, fast, so that it will be available to you. Most of the time, it's not that those things are not available. But you just want them to realize that, no, this thing, everything comes from God. So let's, let us teach them that, no, it's not any human being. It's not me. I'm not the one providing this. It is God. So when we teach them that way, it will help them to believe God for anything. Their faith in God will grow. And I pray that the faith of our children in God will grow in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Esther too had been raised as a woman of faith. Nobody had to tell her that it was time to pray and fast in times of trouble. You can see that she was the one that suggested that, you know what? Gather all the Jews. You people go and fast and pray. I will be fasting with all my meetings. I will be praying too. I will go in and meet the king and discuss with the king. I know it is against the law to go in when you are not called. That I'm ready to bear the consequences. Say, if I perish, I perish. But he knows, I mean, she knows that prayer changes situation. She's a woman of faith. She learned how to depend on God. How do we bring our children? Like I've just said, teach them. Let them believe. Let them know that it's God that provides. And I pray God will help us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Okay. So we must raise 
our children to be useful to God and to the community. We can never tell when God will require the unique skills and talents they learn and the wisdom they learn from us to solve the problems of multitudes. And I pray that God will help us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So from the teaching, from all we've learned about Esther today, I want us to uh, pick out some virtues or some attributes that we have learned from the life of Esther. I want us to pick out some attributes that we have learned from the life of Esther. So if you know anyone, I want you to raise your hand and just give us one. We have quite a number of, of virtues that we have learned. Well, okay, that Mordecai taught Esther. Yes. The virtues that Mordecai taught Esther, that we can see in the life of, of Esther, based on the uh, training she received from Mordecai. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He taught her how to have secrets. Okay, how to, how to keep secrets. secrets. Yes, yes. Thank you, man. Praise yes. God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you for the message, sir. Yes, sir. The one that really, there are a few of them that touch my heart is when Esther allowed the person looking after her, the eunuch, to choose for her. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, very, it's very deep. I've not seen it like that before. Mm -hmm. Because it's possible, maybe not completely right, but it's possible that a particular perfume has been set aside that whoever uses this one will be the queen. Mm -hmm. It's possible that there are some perfumes that are not as good, quote and unquote. And it's possible that the, 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 the person looking after them has read the mind of the king, as you said, and he made those things that will be attractive to the king and made them available to Esther. So if Esther, and Esther was given the privilege, choose whatever you like here, and then whatever you choose, since it's the person that gives you the, the go ahead, you wouldn't have made any mistake. But it, it don't mean that it's wisdom of God for her to have said, Sir, whatever you give me, I go with. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And another one, it got to a state where Mordecai said, Esther, if you choose not to help us, no problem. Help will come for us from another place. Sir. That message is very scary. If you look at the relationship between Esther and Mordecai, from when Mordecai picked her up to that level, there has never been anything like that. There was never a time that they have misunderstanding. There was never a time that Esther did something and the, the uncle also correct her. There was never a time that Esther was not happy because of what the Esther did. But for the uncle to have spoken like that, it's very scary. So that pushed Esther to go the extra mile. If my uncle could talk like this, then that thing has really uh, uh, gone deep into, into him. Then whatever I have to do, I have to do. I need to work out. And then secondly, for him to have spoken like that, he did not completely depended on Esther's position uh, as a means of rescue for himself and for the Jews. If you choose not to deal with your position, no problem. There is a God in heaven that can make a way. It's very so that compelled Esther to do what she did and God helped her. Thank you, sir. Any other person? Any other virtue that we saw in the life of Esther? Yes, sir. Pastor. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I, I, I look at those same two last scriptures um, as a case of faith, jamming faith. Now, um, the, the one, one virtue that I know that Mordecai taught Esther was faith, right? When, when Mordecai told Esther that, you know, if you will not help us, help will come from somewhere else, right? Mm -hmm. That was Mordecai's faith in God. But when Esther also responded that, you know what, go and tell everybody to fast for three days. Me and my maidens will also go and fast for three days. And if I perish, I perish. That was also faith. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, there are people that 
Mordecai could have told that to. And they would say, what's wrong with this man? Said, How can you talk to me like that? Do you know who I am? You know, what, what Mordecai said can offend some people. Tata, what do you, what do you want me to do? I, I'm doing the best I can now. What, 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 do you, what do you mean by that? It can offend some people. But Mordecai's word in faith prompted Esther's response in faith. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So faith is one of the things that, and this faith came from young. So Mordecai was the one that was raising her in faith, right? For the point in time when that faith would become useful to the community. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you very much, sir. Any other thing? Okay. Okay. Okay, somebody here. Praise God. Hallelujah. So for me, sir, I think it was from what you mentioned about Mordecai solely relying on God and not on Esther's position. And while you were saying it, a few things just flashed back in my head. So I have a family member that is quite very bitter with his daughter. And that's because the daughter traveled out, is now making it well, and is not sending monthly income. So there's been a lot of back and forth, and in fact, the relationship is very bad right now. And I've had to ponder on it a lot of times, and there's been lots of arguments between them, especially from the daughter's part, where she says things like, like, um, I'm not a, an ROI, return of investment, <laughs> you know, and she says things like, I'm not your retirement plan, you know, but the ideal thing for most parents, like Mordecai, is that if I've labored over this child, I've trained you, I've sent you to school, I've done everything, the right thing is that when you now, when you're now standing on your own, you should take care of me, you should do everything that I want. But that's not what is happening now. It's like reverse order. And as we were just saying this, I was just remembering how, and I had to go through again to chapter 6, and it still said that Mordecai was still at the king's gate. Of which normally someone like Mordecai would have like, eh, hey, hey. now, Esther, since you are the queen, what will you do about my position? You should, you know, tell the king that you should promote me. Eh, hey, hey. I shouldn't be at the gate. I should be somewhere else. So, you know, it just got done on me that sometimes I think, since we're talking about parents and children, I think it's always important to know that, I'm, I'm not a parent yet, by God's grace, to know that whatever parents are doing for their children, they are doing it for God. They are doing it out of love. They are doing it. Sometimes it's not easy to not have the mindset that I should reap the fruit of my labor. But if that does not happen, it doesn't now mean that the person has failed because this is my family member, and I was like, I failed. Ah, I didn't train this, my daughter, well. You know, I should have been more harsh or more hard. Or maybe I shouldn't have sent her abroad. You know, so many regretful statements are going on right now. And it just got done on me that this aspect, I think, just like Mordecai was, I don't know if I should say he was humble. Maybe that's an understatement. But he just had that heart of, it's not as if I'm doing this because I want to now get a return of, yes, praise God, that's. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The worst mistake you can make as a parent is to ever train your children expecting that they'll come and do anything for you. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, children of these days are very selfish. <laughs> but if you hope on them, you're finished. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Did you hear me? Yes, sir. If you hope on them, you're finished. And that's also a bad mentality. That's what has kept us as black people very, very poor. Very poor. You train a child, you say, okay, when you grow up, you take care of the remaining nine children. You're having nine children. You can't take care of them. You're having them for your first child. That's the greatest mistake you can ever make. Give birth to as many as you can take care of. Don't leave liability for the next generation. Did you hear me? Uh -huh. If your money can take care of one, give birth to one. If you can't train anyone, don't give birth to anybody. No child begged you to bring them into this world. 
Hello. Uh, Did you hear me? Yes, sir. So if you ever have the mentality that your children will come and uh, look at you at old age, you're fooling yourself. Do whatever you can do now for yourself. When you train them, also have plan for your retirement. Keep money aside that you will use to take care of your medicals, except you believe you have faith for divine, for divine uh, help. Divine help yes. uh -huh. And then your housing, make sure you have built your house. If not, you will live under the tree. Amen? <laughs> I'm just telling you the reality. Before I got married, the guy that was our MC, a more senior guy, he told me clearly that if you ever depend on anybody for your sustenance, hoping that people will give you something to take care of your wife, you and your wife will live under the tree. But that does not stop the children from appreciating their parents. It is not, I invest, you, you, you come and take care of me at old age. Whatever they bring, it's an appreciation. So don't ever have the mentality I'll train them to come and look after me at old age. You're making a mistake. You will live a very miserable old man and a very miserable old woman. Praise the Lord. If you like, listen to me. If you don't like, say, Pastor, is talking nonsense. When the time comes and I'm still around you, I will draw your ear and say, I told you. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> and then secondly, she, talk, she talked about secrets. Right? I want to talk particularly for ladies that are going into relationship. You don't because somebody has come to you as a man and in the love, love carried, let me say you were carried away by love and start shooting your mouth anyhow. Amen? The time Eve opened up clearly to Adam was after God had brought them together. The scripture that they were naked and they were not ashamed comes into play for husband and wife, not courtship. In courtship, there are fundamental things you can say. There are certain secrets you can't keep. For instance, you've had a baby before as a man or as a woman, you must tell from beginning. If you are impotent, you must tell from beginning. If you've lost your womb, you must tell from beginning. Those ones that will affect your partner, there's no secrets about it. You must declare fully. Let the person know what he or she is what? Getting into but there are certain things that are not that fundamental that you don't have to be shooting your mouth anyhow because you are falling in love. I don't know if you understand what we're saying. There are certain things you have to protect yourself from until it gets to a certain level where you have to review those things. That's exactly what Mordecai said. Eventually, it was going to be revealed that Esther was a Jew. That the timing was very important. So it's not like you won't tell, but the thing is that there are things that should be tell, told at the beginning. There are things that should be told in the middle. And there are things that should be told after the marriage. So when you go and shoot your mouth earlier than when you should be shooting, and the man runs away on your own, hello. Some of you, some things you have said, before you got married, now you not got married, the man is using it against you. I don't know if you understand what we're saying. So, secrets are to be revealed. Some are the first stage, some are the second stage, and some are the third stage. May the wisdom of God guide you in Jesus' name. Amen. The same thing with men. You, you, are, you have friends, you'll be running your mouth anyhow. Amen? There's a friend that is relatively close to me. Maybe I bring out a car that he has not seen before. You say, I've not seen this one. I say, it's not everything you will see at once. <laughs> you have to be smart. And it's not everything you throw around. Amen? 
So consult me with your fees later so that I'll tell you the details. <laughs> God bless you. Amen. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you all for the contribution, wonderful contributions. Uh, so let me just read a few I have here. I said obedience, number one, obedience. She learned obedience. So don't, don't spoil them with he's just a baby or a small boy. He's just a small guy. He doesn't know anything. No. Whatever obedience they cannot learn at a very tender age. You see some children displaying some level of, small children displaying some level of disobedience and um, stubbornness. I don't know if you have seen them before. If you don't shape them now, hey, when they grow up with that, it's a big trouble, all right? So contentment, we said contentment. Then godliness, teach them godliness. Teach them prayerfulness, very, very important. Then selflessness, selflessness. Don't, it's not just thinking about me, myself, and I. Let them share whatever they have sometimes. There are some clothes in their wardrobe that they are not using again. Tell them, okay, gather these things together, they are still good. Let, we go and give somebody. Do you know somebody that need it? Do you understand? So teach them to be selfless. Then moderation or modesty. Very, very important. Okay, how to instill all this into our children? One, we must be intentional about it. We must approach it prayerfully. Then we must teach them the word of God. We must bring them at a tender age to where they hear the word of God. Very, very important. Some, of, some parents, they come to church, they leave their children at home. Even children that cannot speak. I remember when our, our first son was very, very small. She couldn't even, a baby. We were, pre, we were preparing for one concert, and we go for Riaza every now and then, do night Riaza. The baby was there. When the baby began to speak, she began to sing all those songs. All those songs that we were learning there. So you, you don't say, oh, yeah, this one, she do, he doesn't know anything. No. Bring them to where they will be hearing the word of God. Those words will be registered in their heart. At the appropriate time, the world will begin to grow. Amen. And I pray that the Lord will help us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Shall we please rise to our feet? Let's pray to God. Our Father, please help us to bring up our children in the way that you want us to bring them in the mighty name of Jesus. Help us to nurture them according to your will. Help us to nurture them in your way. In a way that they will not derail from in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Go ahead, talk to God tonight. Just go ahead, talk to God tonight in the mighty name of Jesus that my children will not be wayward in the name of Jesus. They will not be children of Belial. You will help me to nurture them. You will help me to be closer to them. You will help me to pro pro provide every spiritual nurturing that they need in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, faithful God. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Shall we bring, please bring out our offering? Let's bring out our offering to God tonight and just commit the offering to God and say, Father, please, I'm sowing this seed to the future of my children. I'm sowing this seed to the upbringing, great upbringing of my children. Father, please accept it and use it for your glory in the mighty name of Jesus. Ushers, please pass the basket. Why we give our offering? A few announcements. Let's not forget that our, our weekly solution our prayer hosts tomorrow. The time is 11:15 p.m. And I pray that God will bless us as we do in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Shall we please rise as we close tonight. Our Father and our God, we thank you tonight. We appreciate you because you are a good God. We thank you for your word that you've spoken to our heart tonight. Father, we pray the grace to use this word to nurture our children in your way given to us in Jesus' name. As we go home tonight, we pray that all our journeys back home shall be saved in the mighty name of Jesus. We cover our life with the blood of Jesus. When we shall be meeting again, we'll come with